I'll get started. Okay, so welcome to the 21st ICMRBS Early Career Researcher webinar. Um, so as always, we're going to have three very quick talks that last about 10 minutes each. Um, and actually, we're going to go back to a more traditional format this time. So we, rather than having the breakout rooms, uh, we're going to have questions after each talk. So if you have any questions, um, please either raise your hand, type your question in the chat. Um, it'd be great if you could turn your your microphones on and your, your video on and just, just ask them. That, that would be the best way, I think. Um, so after each talk, we'll have a five minutes or so for questions. Um, and then if we have any further discussion, we can take that to the end of the end of the session. Uh, so please hang around at the end if you have any more questions. So I'm going to pass straight on to our first speaker, uh, Diana. I just need to. Let me start sharing the screen. Yep. There we are. Um, oops. There. Um, so thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry that I bailed on you last time. Uh, and thank you for being patient with me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a bit about what we have been doing mostly recently. I, I hope I get there in 10 minutes uh, on the role of conformation and entropy in molecular evolution of acetyl transcriptional repressors. And first I want to introduce the group. Oh, I'm a, sorry. Pointer. Um, first, I want to introduce the group. We are a, a two-year-old group uh, in, based in Buenos Aires. We are generally interested in connecting thermodynamics with dynamic proxies for MNMR. We have an in-house 600 megahertz magnet um, and a bunch of collaboration that allow us to explore uh, higher fields. Um, we are a fairly large group, but only some of the people are strictly involved in biophysics. Uh, the topics go from conformational entropy to more uh, microbiology related questions on how ba uh, pathogenic bacteria deal with stress uh, and how they, they regulate. And for the sake of time, I'm going to focus more on, on this side of things, uh, particularly on how uh, we interrogate conformational entropy to see what role it can have can have on molecular evolution of new elastic connections. And generally, I start my talks convincing people that dynamics are important and there is a structural problem in place, but we need to look at dynamics, but I don't need to do that with you. You are all an MR spectroscopist. You are all well aware of why functional dynamics are important. But let me introduce very briefly uh, the problem that we are working with. So we work with allosteric systems where the active site is connected with um, an allosteric site. Generally, we understand this from a structural perspective where the inhibitor just closes the active state. And the systems that we work with are more similar to this type of systems where the structures do not necessarily hint on what is happening. The inducer binds, but the conformation of this crystal structure at least doesn't change dramatically. So, um, uh, one simple explanation is that the active state, state is between two different conformations. And what the ligand is doing is frozen, freezing the protein in this closed conformation that you also capture in the crystal structure of the apo state. Uh, and what is one of the, the advantages of NMR is that we can measure this uh, intermediate time scale dynamics and see if the protein is indeed visiting two different states. But what made me fell in love with this technique during my postdoc is the ability of NMR to interrogate this really fast uh, time scale dynamics that can be proxied for conformational entropy and can tie together uh, dynamic information and thermodynamic information. So what we are interested in is what is the role in fitness that uh, these uh, fast internal dynamics that contribute to entropy through conformational entropy I, I, what is the role of conformational entropy in fitness and thus in evolution, uh, particularly in anesthetic systems? So uh, essentially, we try to contribute to that very big question by focusing in a particular biomedical problem that is how bacteria responds to host induces stress. Particularly, the human host uh, will intoxicate bacteria uh, with metaions, with reactive nitrogen, reactive oxygen species, as well as antibiotics. And bacteria will build an adaptive response that enable them to uh, continue to grow in the human host. 
And they do that by using effector molecules and regulator molecules. Uh, uh, and the nice aspect of the regulators as a model system for this molecular evolution that happens in bacteria is that they are these relatively small protein solubles that can be, that are animal tractable. Uh, so since they have the same uh, chemical specificity as the effector systems, we can use them as model systems for molecular evolution. Uh, so that's what we do. We work with the different uh, families of transcription regulators trying to understand how these molecules work, how they are electrically connected and how they adapt. And essentially today I'm going to tell you a little bit about an approach that we take on, on molecular evolution that is very simplistic. It's just trying to uh, understand a, a protein family. This protein family uh, is, is a, they are transcription repressors. They bind to DNA down here. Uh, and the, all the existing members are allosterically connected uh, that have an allosteric connection between all these sites, these five sites that sense a wide variety of stimuli with the DNA binding site. And what, what, we, what we want to know uh, is how these, all these sites are connected with this. And one simple explanation would be a molecular wire, but you would need at least five molecular wires uh, to connect these sites with the DNA binding site. An alternative explanation would be that if functional dynamics are playing a role, uh, functional dynamics could help evolvability and could uh, uh, decrease the need of a new molecular wire. So what we try to do is we try to come up with hypotheses where, from, a, from a particular member that is a zinc responsive regulator and te test this hypothesis with the reactive sulfur species regulator. It's like starting to understand molecular evolution to proteins at a time, which is doomed to fail. Like it's, it's clearly a first step. So uh, let me introduce very briefly what we have done in the past with the, um, with the zinc regulator. Essentially, this protein binds tightly to DNA when it is in this conformation, and it doesn't bind to DNA anymore when it is in this conformation. But both conformations, at least from the crystal structures, are very similar. So we cannot use the structural pattern to explain a luster in this case. So what we, uh, what one hint what, of what, what could be happening came from the structure of the DNA bound form that suggested that the protein needs to bend in order to fit into the DNA. That uh, lead to a dynamic hypothesis of how this could be working. Uh, where the uh, zinc binding, the inducer binding was freezing the protein in an open conformation. Uh, while the apoprotein was dynamic. And in order to test that hypothesis, this, since these conformational changes are very small, we used uh, a metal labeling side chain. Uh, we were measuring side chain dynamics instead of backbone dynamics, see, essentially because they are much more sensitive and they report on a different type of motion either way. So we label the protein only in the metals. This is C13, these are protons, and otherwise it's C12 and deuterated. And we measure both conformational exchange uh, as well as conformational entropy by using proxies of uh, fast time scale dynamic. Essentially, we measure conformational exchange with the CPMG experiment. That is the traditional experiment that you would use for the back one as well. Uh, where you have a set of 2D experiments with H, where the intensity changes if that probe is experiencing a conformational exchange. Uh, and we use a double quantum experiment to sample conformational entropy um, or uh, sub nanosecond time scale dynamics, uh, where uh, you use different delays in the millisecond time scale and the ratio between two intensities allow it, us uh, to get information about the nanosecond to picosecond time scale. Um, so the first result that, that was kind of encouraging is that with these probes, we were able to see how the APO state was sampling this closed conformation and how SYNC was freezing it in the rigid conformation. But probably the nicest result from my postdoc came from the fast time scale dynamics, where we saw that SYNC binding was freezing these fast time scale motions uh, in a lot of probes. Uh, and that's what you would expect if you bind a ligand you expect to pay an entropic cost, but that was exactly the opposite to what happened with DNA binding. DNA binding enhanced 
um, dynamics in the core of the protein. And we were able to quantify what was the contribution of all this increased flexibility in the conformational entropy. And this conformational entropy accounted for one third of the delta G. So this uh, entropically favorable contribution is something that could be prevented by the freezing that zinc leads to. So zinc was, could be impairing uh, DNA binding just by redistributing motions internally without the need of a molecular wire. And that allows us to think about how uh, this uh, entropy reservoir that is within the protein could be helping building all these, connect all these new allosteric connections. So uh, now we are trying to test how that works. And essentially we move into a reactive sulfur species sensor that sends reactive sulfur species here and not up here. Uh, and, and this it turns out to be a really nice protein to work with structurally and NMR-wise, uh, and it has a very interesting chemistry. It forms a tetrasulfide instead of a disulfide. Uh, we were able to crystallize this, and from the crystal structure, besides this really fun uh, connectivity, we uh, found that the structures of the um, DNA competent and the DNA incompetent uh, state were very similar, and both of them essentially incompatible with DNA binding. That suggests, again, that probably what the, the, um, the tetrasulfide formation is doing in pairing DNA binding is redistributing motions within the molecule. So uh, a postdoc took the job of, of, of assigning 85% uh, of both the states. This was relatively challenging, and we are still trying to finish that. But essentially, what we see is that, indeed, tetrasulfide bond formation freezes internal dynamics that gives rise to a huge uh, unfavorable conformation and contribution. And that's not unprecedented. We, uh, with, with the zinc sensor, we saw a, a free kilocal per mole contribution that was also unfavorable. And we were able to tune that with different uh, mutations. So this is certainly the, the value of conformational entropy itself when it binds to the inducer is certainly not, not conserved and easy to tune by, by mutations. Uh, however, uh, one uh, the, that doesn't tell us that that's functional. What we need to know to know that these changes in dynamics are functional uh, is the the changes that when the protein binds to DNA. So we are in, in the process of doing that. Uh, we have identified a small enough palindromic sequence where we get a nanomolar subnanomolar binding affinities a low. Um, at low uh, ionic strength. And when we higher the, the, the exhaust concentration, we are able to quantify the entropic and enthalpic contribution. Uh, and uh, what we know so far is that it's extremely exothermic uh, and it has a high entropic cost. So it's, it's likely that, that the, the freezing even more the protein will increase this entropic cost. Uh, and and, and may, maybe the way that this protein is regulated. So I just want to conclude. I hope that I didn't take too much time, uh, but uh, essentially we are, we are trying to understand how allosteric connections are developed in the system, thinking that, that since uh, the structure of the, uh, of the um, DNA competent and incompetent form are very similar and the changes are inherently dynamic, we uh, are, are going to find ideas on how dynamics can contribute to evolution of diversity. And these are the questions that we are currently working on. And I hope that next time we meet, I have more hints on that. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and all the people that are in, were involved in the work uh, for the results and particularly the collaboration with David Gidrock, that is my former postdoc advisor that has helped me get started in the middle of a pandemic. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, okay, so are there any questions? So if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or just, just unmute your microphone uh, would be preferable. Um, whilst we're waiting for questions, Hi, I have one. Oh no, okay, oh. brilliant, we've got a question. Hi, Diana. It's me, Franz, hi. Hi, Franz, nice uh, seeing you great, again. Super nice topic and great systems. 
Um, I have a few questions to which I don't know if you if you can give the answer, but let's let's see. So the um, in some of this entropy meter work, um, it seems that you can mix backbone and sidechain dynamics together with some different weighting functions. Uh, in your experience, uh, do you ever look at the backbone? Do you find that they respond similarly? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, actually, Matthias' thesis is, 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 is revolving around that to try to find, figure out ways to create a hybrid, what I would call a hybrid entropymeter, something that integrates the information from the backbone and the sidechain, because I don't think that, that, that that's that that they that today there is an only way to do that or a right way to do that uh, i don't think that that the correlation that that, that has been shown between the thermodynamic functions uh, and the dynamic proxies have been shown for both of them uh, uh, it's more it, it's either you have a huge backbone contribution and you can calculate that from from, um, I don't know, a more, um, a more theoretical approach, or you use the side chains and you go to a full empirical approach and things in between are kind of um, still not settled. I think like we need good systems. We need, we need systems where both of them are changing. Um, and let me see if I have a, a, a slide from Matthias thesis. Uh, but essentially, we have we we are working on. I don't. Yeah, I have something like that. Um, so, in this system, uh, what we see uh, is that there is a loop that becomes um, it becomes rigid upon binding zinc, and and we what we are trying to do is engineer different mutations where we can balance the contribution of sidechain dynamics to zinc binding with the contributions of backbone. And in that way, we are hoping that we get some empirical information that can validate uh, how to, um, to average the changes between the backbone and the side chains. But the, the yeah. answer is, I don't know. I think that we need more systems, uh, more better model systems where both are changing. Because I think like most of the, of the entropymeter on the side chains are focused on systems where backbone doesn't change much. I don't know. Okay. I mean, you probably yeah. have a, a, more insights than I do on this question, but I just, no, 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 no. So, <clears throat> but it just, um, I mean, we have studied a few mutants of a protein. So is is not published yet, but but one of the problems we ran into is that that some of these methyl groups, I mean, so we studied methyl groups. So some of these methyl groups, they actually change quite a bit. But when you make the assignments, you sometimes are unlucky that you have overlap with some of these side chains. And it could be some of them that are changing a lot that you don't get, and then suddenly it becomes hard to compare. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if yeah. that's, I mean, that's, that's also one of these issues is maybe if the response in the backbone is, is more spread out over all the backbones, maybe it, it matters less what you miss I guess That's so. Yes, more, absolutely. More. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess, I guess that that if all the backbone is changing, these probes should capture what is happening on the environment, right? No, it's not only side chains. It's the, in that particular. You are averaging them. They are probes of the whole dynamics of the system. Mm -hmm. They are not just probes yeah. of side chain dynamics. So yeah, if of course if you have uh, um, the changes in in dynamics on the backbone spread throughout the protein, you are more likely to capture that with the sidechain probe. Yeah, but I think like- That would be good to address, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, again, I think like you need to have a protein where the backbone is changing and that doesn't capture all the entropy contribution because it's true that when the backbone dynamics are changing, you will have a huge contribution of the backbone and probably, the rest of the protein doesn't give rise to a huge entropic contribution. Uh, at least that's what happened here. It was like there were 10 residues. And when we quantify that with the available models, let's say, uh, for, for how backbone dynamics are contributing to the whole entropy, that accounted for half of the entropy, although we were seeing changes in the sidechain dynamics throughout the molecule. 
Yeah, so thanks. I see I, that somebody else has a question. Yeah, sorry. Yes, does anybody else have a question? I'll save mine to afterwards. Um, doesn't look like we've got anyone in the chat. I, I do have a question. Sure, please go Diana, ahead. Diana, congrat, congratulations on your talk. Uh, uh, my question is basic related to the formation, the biological path for the formation of the tetrasulfides. And, the, and if you have an evol evolutionary, uh, a clue how the evolution um, moved, uh, uh, because it has a huge effect on the entropy related binding. So uh, how is the evolution le led to this? Do, do you have any clue? I mean, I, I, I don't know much about the, the, this tetrasulfide formation. Yeah, the problem that we're having looking at evolution on this family is, is that this, this cartoon uh, it, it, it oversimplifies the problem. This is a um, family that, that, that is very old evolutionary, like comes from archaea and uh, from bacteria. Um, and uh, essentially what is happening uh, to us is that it's, it's hard to do a phylogenetic tree that allow us to say, okay, maybe these two, uh, the, the zinc uh, regulators and the reactive sulfur regulation diverge so long ago that, and are different enough. Uh, that is, is, is not that we can trace uh, what happened, what made that so much different. What, what gave me the idea that, that this is not impossible uh, is the fact that with a single mutations we, we can tune uh, we can change several kilocalories per mole on the zinc sensor. So to me, that this having nine kilocalories per mole it's it's not crazy. Uh, but 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 it would be very nice if once we have that and we have the different clusters to see to what extent there are some. Um, some subfamilies, let's say, that, that have higher conformational entropy or smaller conformational entropy. Here you are, uh, with alpha-5, you are taking together these two helices. So this breathing mode is gone. Um, here, we don't see a breathing mode uh, being frozen. So uh, probably you are restricting dynamic in a different way. Uh, pro uh, probably, MD will provide some hints that is hard to get exclusively from experimental data, but so far, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant, okay, thank you very much for a, a great talk and some, some good questions there. Um, we're gonna pass on to Christos, our second speaker. Right, can you see? Yep, looks good. Okay, thank when you ready. So I would like to thank Nick and the organizers for this kind of invitation. Today I'm going to focus on uh, advances and the application of magnetic resonance uh, methodologies that we employed um, in my group working on, on integral membrane proteins. So in my group, we're interested on, on member, integral membrane proteins uh, that are force sensitive. Uh, these proteins uh, can uh, sense changes within the lipid uh, bilayers layers and respond to these changes by changing their structure and function. Uh, what is interesting about these protein, proteins uh, is that they are quite structurally diverse. Um, so neither their structural architecture is conserved nor their oligomeric states. However, they all share a common function and that this uh, it is that they can sense forces within the membrane. So inspiration came a few years ago now when we, 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 we solved the structure of one of these mechanosensitive channel proteins, in this case, and we identified lipids, in particular lipids change within inner leaflet of the membrane and inner leaflet lipids um, residing within these pockets. And at that time, we, we proposed a model called the lipid moves first 
model by which when these lipids are within these pockets, the, the channel is kept closed, and when tension and uh, membrane forces increase within the membrane, um, they pull these lipids out, and then the channel rearranges itself in order to accommodate these changes and uh, open its pore to conduct. Um, also, this um, model has been recently verified and further complemented by other studies, mainly based on trial through microscopy, by which, and here just to name a few, by which they show that these lipids are quite important in, uh, and they define uh, the state of, of this mechanosensitive channel. So our main interest, our first part of the story was about um, trying to extend this model and ask the question whether this model is valid within a stru other structurally diverse mechanosensitive channels. And for that purpose, we chose the, the channel with the highest pressure activation threshold in nature. And it's called the mechanosensitive channel of large conductance, although it's been a small protein. Um, it activates at a tension over 12 millinewtons per meter. It activates as uh, athletic tensions and uh, it acts as a pressure safety valve for bacteria cells um, to prevent and they, they prevent, uh, prevent cell lysis, really. So our first question we tried to address with our magnetic resonance uh, methodology toolkit was where, whether will the channel respond if lipids are restricted from entering these pockets we identified, or equally, can we, could we cause a channel structural response in the absence of membrane tension by sort of molecular means or modifications? And we hypothesized that, um, no, that the, the channel was in the membrane, it has protein stored elastic energy. Under naturally occurring conditions, when membrane tension increases within the membrane, will open the channel. So what we, 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 we thought might be a good idea is to try to identify this final link that the protein makes with the membrane and sort of try to disrupt it by modification, mutation, and so on. And then measure uh, the channel response, the channel change to the, to, to, to the, 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 change, the structural change on the channel. And if, you, if we, we speak in terms of, of the protein, these are, the pockets were identified, and at the end of these pockets, you could see that is the vapor lock of the channel, which controls ion conductance. And yes, so we, we try to effectively lower this pressure activation threshold by identifying these pressures, highly pressure sensitive domains within these proteins. And I don't think I have to go into detail into that in the interest of time, in the interest of time or not. Um, we're using a force pulse spectroscopy, uh, DR spectroscopy or, or caldo spectroscopy. And what we really, is, in a sense, do is we measure spin to spin distances uh, between um, on the sites and after we have introduced them on specific sites on the protein. And it's really what it really provides us is a molecular nano ruler with very, very high resolution. Routine distances we, we're measuring are between 20 to 80 angstroms. All those Smith and Chlorius and um, uh, Chlor, sorry, Smith and Chlor uh, have measured up to 160 angstroms, and also in David Norman's uh, lab in Dundee as well, they have measured this kind of longer distances. But these were done in deuterated proteins. We, in parallel, we employ another methodology called electron spin and echo envelope modulation method, which is a, as you can see here from the pulse sequence. And what this really allows us to do is measure solvent uh, or deuterium accessibility within the same residues. And good news here is that we don't have to remake the samples as they're frozen and they can, we can remeasure them at, uh, with different frequencies. So these measurements are being done at Q-band and these measurements are being done at X-band. And the great thing about the SIM as well is that it offers single residue resolution. But before we start measuring EPR, we need to introduce these spin labels so we introduce make single system mutants. In the case of a heptameric channel, you would expect to get seven systems per channel. And if you covalently attach the spin label, you end up with seven spin labels. Or in the case of the mechanosensitive channel of large conductance, the scale, the one I'm going to talk about, it's a pentamer, you would expect due to pentagon symmetry two distances. And through that process, you are able to, to assess the conformational chain at the conformational state of the protein with really high resolution under a variety of conditions. It's totally flexible, different pH, 
or different bilayers. And within my group, we're employing different uh, lipid scaffolds to investigate these spin label proteins in. And this can vary from liposomes to nanodisks, mouths, saposomes, by cells, and other lipid scaffold systems. Uh, we have also recently reviewed all the studies that have the most of the studies, or if not all the studies uh, that they have rep reported Peldor and their distance measurements on membrane proteins throughout the last 10, 15 years that the technique is really now getting a little ground in structural biology and especially of big complexes. And you can see there is quite, it's quite diverse, it has been applied GPCRs, to APC transporters, ion channels, receptors, etc. And it's a great technique because it can dovetail very well with other techniques, such as NMR, obviously, or mass spectrometry, atomic force microscopy, which is quite a key technique in the case of mechanosensitive channels, electrophysiology for, for function measuring the same, and also with cry -EM. And also offers these advantages, the advantage that you can use only one label rather than two, for instance, as we do normally in FRET. And so you only have one label, and the good news is that this label is of the size, I mean, the golden, one of these labels, which is the golden standard for, for this kind of measurements, the MTSSL spin label, is very close to the size of a tryptophan or a histidine. So it's not disruptive compared, for instance, to Psi 5, which is being used on, on FRET. So we go, we tested different sites, over 20 sites, and most of them are transgender mutants. And we go through a very rigorous uh, process. We purify the sample spin label, the samples, and then we, we, we check a purity, homogeneity, and dispersity of all the endomeric um, scales of the different mutants we introduced. And in order to decide which lipids we're going to involve in our lipid mixture to form nanodisks or liposomes, we also performed the um, in uh, phosphorus NMR, in which we detected specific lipids binding to our detergent solubilized samples. And we further also identified the specific lipids um, by ESMS. And we observed in this case, lipid preference, but not specificity consistent with the idea of mechanosensation because uh, it's important to, to have these lipids uh, in and out, but not like we don't think that is lipid binding uh, rather than lipid movement and penetration of this port. And we further uh, measure spin labeling accessibility, uh, labeling efficiency, and mobility of all the different sites. As you can see here, we've been labeled almost all, all, all the domains of the protein, including transmembrane mainly, but also cytoplasmic mutants. And then we recorded really nice uh, Peldor uh, time traces. You can see here this really nice oscillations. And we can calculate the bipolar coupling and the distance is derived. So this allows us for, for really narrow, nice, defined distance distribution. So we can conclude robust, um, we would have robust conclusions um, in that. And to cut the long story short, I don't have the time to present all the sites, but I'm going to discuss that, uh, to say that we, we identified a single site which was sitting at the entrance of these pockets as you can see here, and that caused a significant conformational change that we quantified of a bore of around nine angstroms in diameter. And this was quite interesting. And uh, we verified that by performing extra uh, functional patch complex physiology measurements to assess function, and these were consistent with these structural observations. Further, in order to um, exclude the fact that this was an artifact of thin label, we introduced a tryptophan at the same position, L89W, and we placed the EPR reporters elsewhere that previously we have not seen any kind of confirmation change. And this time, this time again, we observed a very kind of similar effect on the protein conformation, which was also supported by further low temperature CW EPR um, and also SE measurements that showed increased accessibility in the presence of this modification with disrupted lipid access to these pockets. So to, to, to conclude, uh, as in, it was now, I think is established from this case, there is an expanded intermediate state of around zero nano Siemens and the full open state goes to 1.0 nano Siemens. And you need this extra tension from the pocket delicated state to achieve full opening of the channel. In the case of Mescal again, between the closed and the, uh, the open, there is an expanded intermediate state of one tenth of the total ion conductance of the channel, and then extra tension is required. 
So lipids, we believe that lipids act as negative allosteric modulators since this site we identified was far away distal to the port of the channel. And we believe that these lipids penetrate the pockets to prevent channel opening. And these properties depend on the unique structural pocket landscape of its mechanosensitive channel or MEP4 sensitive protein. And the last question, the last couple of slides, I'm going to say the next question we try to address. So does this pocket delipidated state has any structural analogy um, with, to the tension mediated state? Because transition between these states can follow a, may follow a similar pathway, but not necessarily the same discrete intermediates. In order to address this question, we independently derived and rated a tension mediated state, uh, mimicking mechanical activation, and pocket delipidated state um, by modification. Uh, consistent with the data we had by Peldor. And for that purpose, we, we, we use again a variety of different techniques, including uh, HDX mass hydrogen deuterium mass spectrometry, which also has um, peptide though resolution. And we also perform um, a lot of SE measurements on different sides of the protein in presence and absence of modification. And we characterize this uh, molecularly derived state and we conclude, um, I'm, not, I'm not going to show more data on this because this is under review at the moment, this paper. So whether it's tension or pocket delipidation, the scale samples a very similar expanded state, which we think now is the final step of this delipidation pathway, but only an intermediate stop of the tension mediated path. And therefore, extra tension is still um, required to fully open the channel to conduct to, to free nanosimulation. And finally, I would like to to thank uh, my group and um, in particular previous PhD student, my group who, who did most of this work. Um, it was my first PhD student, we started together at, at St. Andrews and my current lab members. And um, also to say we recently have been awarded uh, another BBA, uh, new BBFSC grant and we're employing um, a, a new fellow um, in EPR spectroscopy. So I would be really uh, glad to hear from anyone who is interested to join our lab um, and apply EPR on, on member on protein systems. And also uh, collaborators, particular Bella and Hassan St. Andrews who helped a lot with this uh, measurement and really are very valuable uh, collaborators. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. <laughs> yeah. So, so first of all, yeah, I would like I would like to thank the organizer to allow me to present this uh, work. Uh, today, and this work will deal with um, yeah, understanding the molecular determinants that allows uh, the transcriptional activation of FOXO4, and this uh, involves another co-transcriptional regulator, which is called um, beta catenin. So first of all, I would like to say a few words about two signaling pathways, which would be of uh, uh, interest today. So this uh, TCF left or FOXO uh, mediated signaling. So under gross condition, you have activation of two different kinases, which are um, PI3 uh, kinase and AKT, which will, by phosphorylation, inactivate the transcription factors FOXO4 and prevent uh, its nuclear translocation. But upon uh, cellular stress and notably oxidative stress, the presence of reactive oxygen spaces into the cytosol can, by different mechanisms, activate FOXO4 and activate its uh, nuclear translocation. Once in the nucleus, FOXO4 can then bind to DNA and activate the transcription of genes, which are um, highly important for uh, the regulation uh, of uh, cell cycle arrest, apoptosis, but as well uh, cellular senescence. And recently, we have already shown that so this co-transcriptional regulator, beta catenin can at least interact with FOXO4 in cells and mediate its transcriptional activation. And this was really interesting because beta catenin is mainly known for, in, uh, known for its central function in the regulation of this VIN pathway, uh, which has completely opposite function because in this case, beta catenin can directly interact with the TCF left uh, transcription factors. And in this case, activate the transcription of genes, which are important for cellular proliferation. So here you can see that the same transcription regulator, depending of to which transcription factor it binds to, will either um, activate cellular death or cellular proliferation. So what we wanted to 
understand in this work, it's first of all exactly how does beta catenin uh, transactivate FOXO4, because this is not known, what, what are the molecular determinants behind this, but as, as well how this switch between beta catenin mediated cellular death or cellular proliferation is made. So first of all, the first question was to, un uh, to understand how beta catenin can transactivate FOXO4. So for this, we so we have already seen before in other paper and already published that FOXO4 can interact with beta catenin in cells, but uh, did not observe this yet in vitro. So we wanted first to map the binding site of beta catenin on FOXO4. So briefly, FOXO4, it's a transcription factor. So it consists of the DNA binding domain, this 4 cat domain, which is conserved in all FOXOs and also of two uh, disorder tails. So a small uh, N-terminal tail here and a 300, uh, around 300 amino acid uh, C-terminal tail, which is fully disordered. Uh, so then what we did is we use NMR to, um, to characterize the binding of beta catenin here to different regions of FOXO4. So I won't enter, I won't present all today, but we show that beta catenin can no can no bind, uh, can not interact with the N-terminal disorder tail of FOXO4. And we could observe weak binding to the DNA binding domain. But more interestingly here, and it's what I present now on the right side, it's our um, uh, NMR titration of the of label of 15 label the whole C-terminal tail with or without um, uh, beta catenin full lines. And here you can see line broadening of several signals. And when, you had, when we had a closer look at those, we could see that all affected amino acid cluster in two um, uh, distinct regions, which are this conserved region three, which is conserved in all FOXO, and as well this small site here that we will call later this CR PKB site because there is some putative phosphorylation site in this region. So what we did then is to try the binding of beta catenin to this individual site. So either this uh, CRPKB site or this CR3 site. And again, using NMR, so we titrated either or uh, these two region with or without beta catenin and could observe nice uh, interaction. So there's two binding sites are sufficient to uh, mediate um, uh, to mediate beta catenin binding. So overall, we could observe three different binding sites of beta catenin and FOXO4 involving either the 4 cat domain, this um, uh, CR, this conserved region with a putative phosphorylation site, and this conserved region three uh, part of FOXO4. So as there is some putative phosphorylation site in this region, we were wondering if phosphorylation of this site might uh, affect um, beta catenin binding. Therefore, we uh, move on to do some phosphorylation assay using this uh, uh, conserved region that bind to beta catenin. So what we did first is just to compare the uh, 15NHLQC spectra of this region alone or inside the uh, uh, human uh, HEC lysate. So here we make use of the human kinases inside this lysate, and you can see uh, in the blue spectra some appearance of uh, a 1H 15N cross peak around 8.5 to 9 ppm, and those are really characteristic of um, uh, phosphorylated uh, uh, signals. So we could assign them and assign them to four different serines, so the serine 241, 262, 265, and 268. And when we had a look at the sequence, so the 262 site was um, could be a consensus site for phosphorylation by uh, PKB, whereas 265 and 268 could be a, a consensus site for the for, for phosphorylation to CK1. So then we moved to uh, um, do some phosphorylation assay, but this time using commercially available recombinant kinases. And here we could see uh, that if we add CK1 alone, which is this pink spectra, we could not observe any phosphorylation of this FOXO4 region, whereas addition of PKB can uh, uh, recapitulate the phosphorylation of the serine 262 here. But when we add uh, both kinase together, then we recapitulate the three phosphorylation sites, which are 262, 265, and 268 uh, here, showing that this PKB phosphorylation of the serine 262, it's in this case a priming event for, the for CK1 mediated phosphorylation of this serine 265 and 268. So again, as this uh, region is involved in beta catenin binding, we wanted to uh, assess what would be the effect of phosphorylation of the site in terms of um, beta catenin uh, binding. So here I just show uh, 
a one H projection of different uh, 59 HSQC of the three different form of this CR PKB site. So either the wild type form or the PKB form. So just only one phosphorylation event or PKB CK1 with three phosphorylation events and compare without in dotted line or with beta catenin in plain line. And here you can see for the wild type, so the black line that there is a a uh, massive decrease in intensity upon beta catenin binding, which is somehow recovered uh, once you introduce either one phosphorylation here in cyan or three phosphorylation in, here in orange, show, uh, showing indeed that this phosphorylation site uh, inhibits uh, beta catenin binding. So I won't go in detail here for sake of time, but this we confirm in cells and also could show that one phosphatase PP2A was involved in the uh, dephosphorylation of this serine 262. So here what we could see is that PKB and CK1 might um, impair or at least inhibit beta catenin binding where whether PP2A might activate um, or at least uh, yeah, allow efficient beta catenin binding. So then there, we, there were another point that were, we were really interesting. It's whether you can have um, auto, -inhibit, auto -in inhibitory form of uh, FOXO uh, itself, because it has already been shown for FOXO3, another FOXO member, that this CR3 site, which is the really end of the C-terminal tail, uh, can interact uh, with the DNA binding domain, with the forked domain. So first, we wanted to confirm whether this is true for FOXO4 as well, and did some titration of either 15N label for with CR3 or vice versa, and show in both cases a nice binding event. So we then uh, uh, solve the uh, structural model using molecular dynamics together with many different uh, NMR restraints. So we use uh, spin label, so PRE restraints uh, with spin label either on the forked or on the CR3 side. We had a uh, couple of ambiguous and non-ambiguous uh, NOE, uh, also some dihedral angles, and yeah, we, we got to this uh, structural model where I sh show you here the 10 lowest energy um, uh, structures, um, and you can see that the CR3, which is fully disordered uh, by its own, can adopt uh, alpha helical structure once bound to the forked domain, but what is even more interesting is if we overlap our structure bound to the CR3, uh, uh, region to the structure of the forked bond to DNA, you can nicely see here that the two binding surface overlap uh, really uh, nicely together, highly suggesting that the CR3 binding to the forked domain will impair or at least inhibit uh, DNA binding. So this we confirm uh, using a calorimetry experiment. So we saw that DNA binding to the forked domain by its own have an affinity around 200 nanomolar. Whereas if we use a fusion construct where we link this CR3 part to the forked domain and then allow the auto inhibitory conformation, then we decrease by around a factor 10 the affinity of DNA uh, to the forked domain. And really interestingly, because we have seen that the CR3, it's also the site, one site which allows efficient beta catenin binding, we were hypothesizing that beta catenin binding to the CR3 part can release it from the forked domain and then allows um, efficient DNA binding. And indeed, when we add beta catenin in this system, we recover the uh, DNA binding affinity, which is similar than in the context of the forked domain alone. So which shows that in a, a in absence of beta catenin, you really have this uh, auto inhibitory conformation where the CR3 binds to the forked domain and inhibits uh, DNA binding here. Whereas beta catenin binding to the CR3 and two, addi two additional sites can uh, release the CR3 from the DNA binding domain and allows efficient trans uh, tra um, transcriptional activation of uh, FOXO4. So really quickly, if I have still yeah, uh, two to three slides, the second question was to uh, understand how this switch between FOXO4 uh, uh, beta catenin or TCF uh, beta catenin signaling is made because one signaling directs the cells towards cell death and the other towards cell proliferation. It's important to understand uh, how this switch is made. And so here, there were already a nice clue that so there is another uh, beta-catenin binding partner, which is called ICAT, which has 
previously been shown to interfere with TCF left binding. So once ICAT is bound to beta catenin, this will prevent uh, cellular proliferation. So now we were hypothesizing that this complex, uh, while it interferes with TCF left binding, might still allow uh, efficient FOXO4 binding and therefore switch uh, towards FOXO4 signaling. And in order to confirm this, so we did either NMR competition essay or ultra centrifugation essay. And in both cases could uh, indeed confirm that ICAT binding to beta catenin does not prevent uh, FOXO4 uh, binding to beta catenin. And this we also confirm in cells where we could nicely uh, see that you, we could immunoprecipitate uh, FOXO4 uh, together with ICAT and beta catenin here, but could not immunoprecipitate TCF4 uh, in presence of uh, uh, ICAT. And we confirmed during some transcriptional activity essay. So this is to um, monitor the transcriptional activity of the TCF left gene and this of FOXO4 of FOXO uh, derived uh, targets. And we could see that in presence of ICAT, indeed you uh, decrease the transcriptional activity of the TCF left uh, target genes, whereas you somehow activate uh, even the transcriptional activity of FOXO4. So in conclusion here for, uh, for this uh, second short part, we saw that indeed uh, ICAT binding to, be uh, to beta catenin is um, um, in agreement, so allows uh, formation of a ternary complex with FOXO4, but prevents uh, binding of TCF left, and this allows a switch from cellular proliferation to cellular death. With this, I would like to uh, thank my group and the group of uh, Tobias Madel um, here in Graz, uh, as well as our collaborator, mainly in Utrecht, that did uh, most of them, or even all of the cell biology uh, uh, experiments. And you for your attention. Thanks very much, Benjamin. Okay, so do we have any questions? I realize we've just gone over the hour mark, so I think we have lost a few people. Doesn't look like it. I'm afraid I have, I have a question. Can I ask Brilliant. a question? Absolutely. Uh, ben, can you comment on the interaction that you showed of beta catenin binding to the forehead domain? Because you don't show that in your in the model that you have in the schematics. Yeah, we, we had to go. So there were basically line broadening of almost all signals. So I could not map the binding site because in these cases, um, I have to say that at normal temperature, uh, so at around 25 degrees, we could observe such uh, fast separation behavior, which has already been shown for beta catenin uh, in complex with other um, uh, protein partners. So it suggests now more and more that you might have some transcriptional condensates where beta catenin fast separate together with other uh, uh, transcriptional activator uh, or repressor. And it might be that also in this case, so we, we, we did not went in this direction yet, but at least um, at uh, 25 degrees, so at room temperature, we could observe a separation of beta catenin to, um, uh, to the forked domain uh, by its own. And only going to uh, yeah, around 10 degrees, we could observe um, soluble beta catenin forked complex, but this led to a line broadening of all signals. So we could not really map the binding site of beta catenin onto the forked domain. Yeah, and, and how does that fit with your auto inhibition model? 